In our last lecture, we were discussing about the U.S. legislation uh, uh, that actually allows their intelligence agencies to uh, do the wiretapping. Wire uh, we discussed Title III, that was uh, in the 60s, then Foreign Intelligence Surveillance uh, uh, Act, then PRISM program. That program was actually uh, directly, I mean, it's, it's in recent time that when it was actually disclosed that the U.S. Uh, security agencies and intelligence agencies are using the, the servers of the big companies like Microsoft, Google, Yahoo to, to get the access uh, uh, to the data of uh, the users of these companies. So uh, it, it, it seems like there is, uh, in fact, no privacy. Electronic Communications Privacy Act was passed in 1986 and then again it was actually uh, allowed to the police. Uh, police was allowed to, to have access to the, the calls to intercept the, the communication and the, this is like pen register that the uh, police can see that uh, who is actually calling and then trap and trust devices that they can actually also see that uh, uh, I mean, <coughs> call from this end, uh, the dial number from this end, where the call was received, and uh, this is the way that actually they they can see at the both ends, and then uh, if someone is like uh, kind of uh, their potential target and they identify something is uh, suspicious uh, going on, they can actually continue it. In this act, they actually uh, bound the police to. Uh, ask court for the permission but then again they have no I mean they, they, they were not bound to show the, the reasons that why they want to actually uh, do this activity so this was like uh, uh, more privilege to, to towards police and the agencies and uh, then they, they also have the roving wiretaps uh, roving wiretap is actually uh, like someone connects with person A then that person a connects with person B, so they, they can actually follow it, this, this chain of connection. Stored Communications Act, it was like uh, part of uh, that Electronic Communications Privacy Act. And again, in this case, uh, I mean, in, according to this act, the government doesn't need to actually uh, show the, the warrant and they, 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 they actually uh, they can actually, if they, they, they identify someone that is, uh, that with some doubtful uh, activities or they have some evidence about uh, that individual, so they can actually uh, do this, uh, this, I mean they, they have access to the, the communication information, they have access to that uh, specific uh, communication. Uh, now in recent time, uh, digital due process. This is uh, the movement that is initiated by the big companies like uh, Microsoft, IBM, Intel, Google and they are actually lobbying Congress to change this law because they, they, they feel that it is actually compromise on the privacy of users. So it should be stopped when there is some solid and strong reason then they, they should actually ask for the permission from the court and then they they, 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 should, they should be allowed. <coughs> Another kind of uh, act, similar act is communication assistance for law enforcement again to, to ensure the security. It is like uh, uh, they have the permissions to do it. So again a compromise on the privacy and uh, it's, it's a debate that either it's, it's good or it's bad because uh, when you you want to make more secure so you need to have more access and if you have more access to the information it is again compromise on the privacy. Another important act that was uh, uh, passed that is US Patriot Act. This act was actually uh, after 9-11 they decided to increase this uh, monitoring uh, activities so uh, 
in this act they have the provisions uh, to monitor again to monitor the communications they have uh, i mean more powers to actually uh, regulate the the financial transactions to to control the the bank's transactions they have more access to uh, information that is available with the bank they have uh, more uh, you know uh, access to the, the the borders controls so they it's, it's I mean it's it's actually giving more privileges to the the security agencies and the, their intelligence agencies and they actually introduced more penalties for for the crimes like uh, we discuss now nowadays not only the traditional crime but the cyber crimes so uh, th this is kind of comprehensive uh, act related to this this I mean the, this context so again the critics of uh, this act they say that uh, it is uh, again compromise on the privacy of individuals the fourth amendment of the US Constitution actually allows individuals to have their privacy and if there is some solid reason there there are some you know justification then uh, this I mean information gathering and access to the information should be uh, after the warrant after the permission so uh, if uh, we are actually not going for permission we are not asking for permission so it means uh, that we are actually compromising on privacy there is another uh, kind of uh, mechanism that was adopted by FBI and their intelligence agencies that they can just write the the, the letter to some specific uh, office and they they can ask for the information about the individuals about the users of uh, that specific uh, uh, system that specific office so so that is uh, like uh, another way to actually get the access to information and uh, just see the numbers like uh, FBI issued 50,000 uh, national security letters to different departments to different offices in in just three years time again national uh, their national agency got the access to the telephone records and then it is again uh, something that is uh, actually have kind of controversial guys uh, kind of controversial issues like uh, why they have access to to the the calls data and uh, it is not only if I, I mean the to s it is not actually for the specific individual but it is like the the open access to to the call data of everyone and for longer period of time <coughs> now we discuss uh, the regulation of uh, such databases either these are public or are the private databases <coughs> okay uh, in in our earlier lectures we discussed like uh, the the information collected through the census that was uh, uh, just for the purpose of uh, the planning for the government they, they they want to I mean know about their population but uh, there are evidences that they misuse that information for different uh, other purposes for different other reasons so uh, in 65 is uh, like uh, uh, the director of the budget committee that that actually said that it is you know is uh, uh, when we have the scattered data when we we have the decentralized information then there is there is, is, is like uh, there is a problem with the, with this kind of data so we we should have uh, I mean they suggested that uh, they, they, they should have the the national uh, data center where they have uh, the you know, is uh, access to the all information at the same uh, at the same place so at that time they actually uh, drafted the document to create the national database <coughs> then there is debate that okay if we have such kind of central database so it should be known by the everyone it, it, it shouldn't be like the secret database 
So the code of fair information practices is like that. People should know that there is a, such kind of database and the people should also have access to their personal information. They can actually fix, they can modify the data. If there is some incorrect information, they should have access to actually fix it. So this is like uh, then it's kind of a balanced approach that you have the central data, you have the database, but uh, at the same time uh, people know it and they, they have the access to see their information and they have the right to actually modify the incorrect information. There is another Privacy Act of 1974, again uh, this is like uh, for the government databases, uh, I've been, there are uh, different times, a different uh, kind of, uh, I mean the, the creation of different kind of databases and when these databases are created, uh, then there is issue of access and uh, then government passed, uh, are come up with the regulations that okay, who will have the access and what kind of access it will be and uh, then who are the responsible for that database. But anyways, this is this act actually allows different agencies to the share the, the information. <coughs> that was about uh, legislation regarding the public databases. Now the legislation for the private institutions, the private databases, uh, we discuss one by one. Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, this act says like, okay, uh, the credit information of the users, uh, I mean the, the customers of the banks though, who are actually have the different kind of uh, banking services, credit services. They, they should, uh, they should uh, provide the accurate information and they should uh, uh, have the mechanism to actually uh, protect that data, no misuse of data and if they have some negative information like someone was uh, uh, not able to actually pay back the, the loan in the due time and uh, he or she was a default, uh, this is kind of the negative information. So that negative information uh, should be kept for uh, seven years time and then again if uh, I mean in, in any you see, uh, we observe the different acts have different kind of uh, regulations, but at the same time they have uh, exceptions. So exception is like uh, if there is uh, information about bankruptcy that, that should be maintained, that should be retained for uh, 10 years and uh, if there is some criminal, you know, convictions, criminal information, criminal activities, that information should be, uh, that should be kept forever. Another act about the private databases is Fair and Accurate Credit Transactions Act and that act was uh, passed in 2004 and again it's actually, it, it gives privilege to, to the, the account holders, to the consumers that they can actually ask for their, their account statements uh, after every 12 months time and uh, it is not about, uh, I mean, uh, by default, it's not like, okay, they will send a bank statement to every, every consumer, every customer, every individual, but if someone is interested for the bank statement, then they are actually bound to provide the, the same document. So, that is uh, a, another, you know, the mechanism to actually, uh, we discussed in previous lectures that uh, what is identity theft, how the information, personal information is misused. So this, this act actually helped to reduce identity theft. <coughs> Financial Services Modernization Act, this is another example of the act that was passed and that was related to uh, uh, private databases in, in this uh, uh, act they actually consider I mean uh, rather than having the traditional banking services and the tradi traditional uh, business transactions they actually say that this uh, is a kind of uh, we have the financial supermarkets like uh, we have the banking services insurance services and other you know stock exchange services and these all actually services uh, uh, have the huge information, I mean the, the big data and the very relevant information 
to specific individuals. So uh, we should have, uh, I mean, the mechanism to protect this data and how to actually do it. So just see that uh, whatever is the policy, in the recent time we observed that the different organizations, uh, particularly in the U.S., they were bound to actually uh, share their privacy statements, their privacy policy with their customers, with their end users, and uh, we received such kind of uh, uh, emails uh, and messages that uh, you need to, I mean, uh, you, you should go through the, the privacy policy and you need to agree with uh, that policy if you want to continue the service. So this is another example that if you have the data that is in this specific context that is financial data of the individuals so there must be kind of privacy to, to, to protect it next topic is data mining by the government data mining is the concept that is uh, used hopefully you are familiar with the with this concept if you have uh, the database with the large data with the, the number of records in that database. You can use it for the different purposes. You can infer different kind of information from that data. So the formal definition is the process of uh, searching through one or more databases. I mean uh, it is quite possible to have more than one databases. And, uh, and the, the real data mining is like you actually see the relationship between the data. You actually see the uh, patterns you are like in in uh, in today's economy it is very important that if you want to see the the sales pattern of your company you want to predict the sales for the next few months or some specific time if you have the customers data you can actually uh, apply different data mining techniques to predict this <coughs> Okay, IRS, what we said, it's, it's responsible for uh, tax collection in the U.S. They do IRS, uh, uh, IRS audits. It is called audits. And audits are actually mean to assess the, the tax returns of the, the people if they are actually uh, paying tax, what is uh, actually due, or they are actually making some, you know, uh, they are providing some... Uh, uh, wrong information about their incomes and their taxes so the uh, obviously it is uh, really difficult to do it manually so they have systems they have uh, software that actually compare the information provided by the uh, by the by the customers by the the taxpayers and then they have the the numbers they have the data and they actually try to match and then then they try to find the patterns and they in the, in this way they can actually uh, identify the, the possible uh, areas uh, or possible cases of uh, the, the, the defaulters. Syndromic surveillance uh, systems. Uh, it's a system like uh, based on the data you can actually predict that uh, what kind of uh, uh, viral disease is going to spread in the near future and they, you can I mean based on the data we we already like in uh, in Pakistan for last few years uh, uh, dengue fever is quite common in Pakistan and uh, in different areas they actually have the patterns and the data so based on that data they can actually predict that uh, in, in 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 next few uh, weeks time are various of a possibility to actually uh, spread this uh, fever, this uh, dengue fever, so they can actually take the precautionary measures and then they can actually avoid the, the, the possible, you know, is, uh, sufferings of the people. So it's the same is the case that uh, they, they did actually in the U.S. for the different uh, viral, viral diseases. Okay, telecommunications records database. Obviously, uh, it's, it it would be the the huge database. Like uh, they have uh, millions of uh, the call records, and uh, uh, after 9/11 attacks, they are. Uh, I mean, the U.S. government is more sensitive uh, towards the uh, security, and uh, so they they are actually 
have this database that they have a uh, lot of, I mean, obviously millions of Americans are making calls and that, that all data is there and that, that, that can be used actually like uh, in my personal case, uh, if uh, someone has access to my data, they, 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 they can know that, okay, at what time I am making most calls and uh, to which number I am making most calls at what time and, uh, uh, and uh, maybe at the, what day. So that is uh, the information that may be very useful in that, that personal context. Predictive policing is another concept that is uh, again based on the data you can actually decide okay uh, where are the areas or what are the events that are going to happen where some kind of uh, you know social activity or gatherings are, are going to happen and uh, you can actually uh, based on the, the data you can decide where to actually deploy please uh, uh, more in number and which are like uh, it, on Facebook, on social media, uh, we, we know that okay this event is going to uh, happen and uh, how many people are interested to attend this uh, event. So this is a kind of information that can be uh, useful f for the security agencies. Now the next uh, topic of discussion is national identification card. Uh, we all are familiar with our CNIC number. We have a CNIC number is uh, our unique identification number and now pa government of Pakistan is actually uh, planning to make it is like a uh, real unique ID that should be used for uh, all uh, key information that is required by the government or by the individual. In Pakistan we have uh, Nadra who is uh, responsible for uh, issuance of the national ID cards and uh, we are all familiar but in the US they have a social security number and that was started in uh, in uh, I think in 30s uh, yes in uh, 1936 they uh, started uh, this social security number and at that time we don't have uh, computers so it was done by the, the, the clerical staff by the humans and they have uh, I mean they they need to manually uh, write the data, enter the data in the, in the given forms and there was, uh, I mean there was a lot of chance of uh, um, error or mistakes uh, because uh, everything was manual. So <coughs> that social security number was initially actually to actually support the unemployed people and they to give them the social support. Um, that was the objective. It was not actually uh, just, I mean it was, uh, th that was not the intention to make it like unique ID uh, for, uh, for, uh, for an individual, but it was just for the purpose to, 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 to the, the, the social, social purpose. Uh, but later on it's, it's like, uh, was used as like personal identification number that is unique ID, but uh, with SSN, the social security number, they have some problems like uh, there was, uh, it was quite possible to, to actually, uh, I mean the two individuals have the same social security number because different post offices at that time were responsible to, to allot the social security number. So by mistake or by intention it is quite possible that same number is issued to, to, to different individuals. And then there was no mechanism of actually verification. Uh, verification mechanism was actually not there. So they just asked people to provide their social security number and they, there was no verification. So they, again it's, it's a chance of actually, uh, you know, it's uh, dodging the system or it's like a chance of mistake. And, uh, they, they, they don't have actually the capability of error detection. If someone is, uh, I mean, someone with uh, very good intention but by mistake uh, he or she is providing uh, the number that is incorrect, so they have no such kind of mechanism. I mean, when you are writing the numbers, you, you may make mix mistake. You, I, I write six, perhaps you understand it's like eight, so quite possible. 
So in US they have uh, this debate that this social security number should be replaced with the national ID card. Uh, in, in US they have a driving license and that driving license have the personal information plus that social security number but they don't have uh, I mean in the, in the recent past they, they, they don't have uh, the national ID card. Uh, so uh, they said that okay uh, we, we, we should have the ID card because uh, current uh, driving licenses are not up to the mark, they are not like the standard, the, now we have uh, very good technology and uh, we have good facilities to produce uh, uh, card that are, that are uh, more secure. So the argument for the national ID card is like if someone has the ID card then it is easy to identify and we can actually stop the people to enter illegal to US and uh, <coughs> because they said that in, in this case you need to provide your identity so if you have your ID card so you can use it you can actually stop the illegal workers in US and uh, and they, they, they think that this is, is, is a way to actually reduce the crime because if you have the unique identification number so it will be easy to identify people. And obviously other, other countries also have, many countries have this uh, national ID card like I told and we, are, we, we have uh, national ID card. <coughs> okay. What are the arguments against the national ID card? There are people who are actually against this uh, card system that the unique ID. So they say that it, it, it cannot be granted if, if we cannot guarantee with the social security number or the driving license. In the same way we can actually not guarantee that if we have the card we will reduce the crimes and there will be no illegal activity. Ultimately we are humans, we are I mean, like in Pakistan, we know in, in pre, I mean, uh, in recent past that Nadra cancelled a lot of uh, cards that are issued to non-Pakistani citizens. So, our multiple cards are issued to the single individual to the, the who is uh, Pakistani national, but uh, he or she has more than one card. So, the system doesn't guarantee that uh, it will be 100% secure. Again, another discussion is like, uh, although we have biometric systems and uh, we have such technologies, and we can uh, differentiate people, individuals, but still it's not 100% accurate. So if we have uh, some sort of uh, biometric identification, it's still not 100% accurate, not 100% reliable. So they say that it is, uh, I mean, uh, having this kind of uh, uh, card, we still cannot guarantee. Again, uh, if uh, someone doesn't have uh, the social security number uh, or someone has social security number, the crimes, crime, I mean the crimes are in, our, uh, I mean they're, they're, they're in, in different societies, uh, the possibility of crime is always there. Sometimes in some society, its crime rate is like low. In some other society, crime rate is high. But having unique identification doesn't mean that we can actually uh, really control the crime. This, I think, uh, is, is actually the the different debate. Is uh, perhaps we need to have uh, more better society, more better. Uh, uh, training and education to reduce the crime. Just having the unique ID it doesn't contribute to to uh, to reduce the crime. Some people say that if we have central uh, database, uh, we have uh, unique identification, then it is really easy for the government to actually uh, have access to the information like we are discussing the privacy problems uh, when we have uh, different national and private databases and uh, people feel that their privacy is compromised and uh, in that case when we have unique ID and everything is associated like in Pakistan now they are doing it that they are the government is trying to actually link everything each thing with with the, our national ID card number so it means they have access to each and uh, each, each, each and everything. 
So that is this kind of uh, compromise on privacy. There is another argument against this national ID card that people in general they are like uh, obedient, they actually follow the rules and regulations. So it will be easy for some other guys, for some other peoples to actually deceive the, the people who are actually following the rules and regulations. That is like uh, they are more vulnerable to fraud. If uh, I have a unique ID and that ID is actually, uh, I mean that is identity theft again. And so my personal ID is uh, the way to actually uh, damage my repute and my uh, my belongings, whatever it is. Another act that was passed by U.S. is with the title Real ID Act. The Real ID Act is uh, to change the current uh, driving license with this uh, Real ID. And so uh, they said that, okay, uh, we can use this uh, driving license as our key document, as our identifier, but we need to replace it uh, we have uh, the better, you know, the car that, uh, that, that should be more secure and uh, that should have uh, more uh, relevant information and uh, there should be no uh, uh, compromise on the privacy of the individuals because the current driving uh, licenses are easy to actually, uh, easy to actually counterfeit and uh, people uh, who are criminal are involved in the such activities uh, they can easily you know is uh, uh, use that information of other individuals of other people so they say that this real id act allows are actually uh, bound the uh, states in, in within usa to come up with the new cards and they they can actually uh, have this uh, uh, new 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 card with the the more relevant information and more secure and uh, in recent time now almost uh, almost uh, all states of uh, uh, US uh, have complied with this uh, this real ID act again uh, what the possible disadvantages we discussed for the national ID card if we have the unique ID so the same uh, uh, apprehension uh, of the people are about the real 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 ID I mean the, if they are getting the new licenses then again there is compromise on the privacy because they have the central database that is uh, that information is available to the, the agencies and the federal government and then they, they, they may, I mean, uh, again, the compromises on the privacy. The next topic uh, is about uh, information dissemination. I mean, how to disseminate the information. So again, there, there is legislation about uh, information dissemination, and uh, it's, it's like. Uh, if someone has the access to the information, someone has information about the individuals, then uh, how to actually distribute this information. Uh, obviously, the legal usage of that information, uh, I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in the scenario where that information is required by some uh, state uh, agencies, then it's okay, but it is not like uh, just for the commercial purpose, uh, we distribute the information. So we discuss the legislation that is done in this context. Family Education Rights and the Privacy Act. This is uh, the act uh, that is uh, for the, the family, uh, family members and uh, they actually can, uh, they, they can access the information that is relevant there about, uh, relevant to those family members and they, if they feel that it's, it's incorrect information, then they can actually uh, fix it. They can actually modify the information. So uh, they, they have right to actually stop the, the government to share that uh, information 
with other, uh, with other institution, institutions or the organizations. In case of children, uh, I mean the children less than 18 years, their parents have uh, this right to actually access this information and to modify it. <coughs> it is another uh, act about the video uh, privacy. You know, uh, there are different uh, stores where you can get uh, videos uh, on rent. So they have your information that at what time, what kind of uh, videos you, you got from that store. So that is the information that shouldn't be uh, shared with, uh, with other, other organizations or the individuals. So they, they, they have, I mean, uh, it, this act actually uh, has the provision that uh, the rental stores must actually uh, discard the information after uh, you know one year time. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This is uh, about medical information. Again, medical information is uh, sensitive information of the individuals, and uh, how to use that information. This act actually uh, have the provisions that the uh, okay medical staff doctors and uh, other relevant uh, uh, staff can actually have the access but that information shouldn't be actually uh, shared with others particularly the health insurance companies they are interested in uh, such kind of information this act says that uh, that information shouldn't be uh, shared with uh, others uh, until unless you get the consent of the patient if patient is willing to share uh, his or her information, then the, the organization has this right to actually share. Freedom of Information Act. Uh, uh, in Pakistan, we say um, uh, information access right. Uh, this act says that, okay, if we are interested in uh, any public information, I mean information, data about any public office, then uh, we can request, the citizen of that country can request, in this context, the, the U.S. citizen can actually uh, request for the uh, public information and uh, organizations are bound to provide that uh, specific information. But again, there are exceptions. Uh, I mean, uh, the general public cannot actually get access to the, the classified information or like uh, the information that is about uh, IP rights like uh, the trade secrets or some other documents that are relevant to the, the law enforcement agencies. <coughs> okay, another, another scenario, possible scenario, an interesting, uh, uh, you know, the kind of information that is collected is on the, the motorways. Like in Pakistan, we have uh, M tag and previously we have E tag and that E tag and M tag obviously is associated with some some vehicle registration number and uh, that has uh, you know is uh, that that is information that is really uh, I mean it's it, it can be useful in in some specific context so that information shouldn't be. Uh, public, uh, no one should have access of uh, my travel history uh, until unless I am also interested to share that information. The, so in, in U.S. the easy pass, that is like uh, that kind of tag that is uh, the way to actually uh, pay the toll on the motorways and that information is used by the police and their, and their security agencies when they they have, uh, I mean, uh, some specific evidence of some criminal or some other activities uh, that involve some the legal proceedings so that they can actually use this information. So this is another, you know, is uh, the huge database that can be used uh, against the individuals. Now, we discuss about the, the privacy invasion or the activities that are related to the, the invasion. In other, in other words, when uh, the privacy of the individuals or the organization or the group of the people is violated and uh, 
this is like a government action actually I mean different regulations are uh, the way to stop this innovation but sometimes what I said government itself involved in this kind of invasion so they have the different uh, uh, regulations like this one do not call registry it's quite interesting uh, quite interesting act that uh, as you know in evening time there are different telemarketing firms they make calls to uh, people in US and uh, uh, they feel annoyed and disturbed at their family time so uh, this uh, act actually provided the, the facility that okay you can actually register your number in a database that is do not call registry so if you have number in that database so telemarketing firms cannot actually uh, make calls at your numbers so this is the uh, just see like more than 50 million uh, phone numbers were registered but I mean people are such annoyed they, they don't want others to make call like in Pakistan we have a lot of SMS uh, uh, that are unwanted SMS that for sometimes like uh, people who who are actually who want to dodge you like uh, Benzir Income Support Program and the Jito Pakistan and so on and sometimes they are just doing uh, the marketing of their products and you get the unwanted messages and so uh, although it's again it's kind of illegal activity our in, in our context PTA has rules and regulations that uh, if someone is actually sending message uh, uh, without the, the, the content then you can report it so in the same way in US they can actually have this kind of database where you can register your number and uh, it's obviously is something good for, for the users. Another very interesting regulation is COM Act. Uh, you have uh, uh, observed this like uh, we are watching uh, TV programs and uh, the sound or the volume of the TV program is uh, relatively low or uh, you may say that when there is a commercial break so the ads on the, the TV channel the, the, the sound is quite high of those commercials so that is obviously disturbing and annoying so they, they have the same problem in US so then actually this calm actor uh, forced by the government that uh, okay the, the sound the, the, the loudness of the, the, the ad should be the same as of that program where the, the interruption occurred so this is something really good for uh, in general for our environment and for our health here is another act like uh, in Pakistan we have also heard this uh, ephedrine ephedrine is uh, the, the, the kind of drug the medicine that is used for asthma so if in, in US if you want to take that kind of drug uh, so you have to provide your personal information and uh, everyone can actually get the, the specific dose the specific prescription of that that drug so this is another kind of information that is uh, available to the government and the agencies so uh, this is uh, I mean this is another possibility that the, the people or the government the agencies can actually see the pattern like we discussed in, in the previous slides that uh, hospitals have the sensitive information uh, about the patients Another possibility of uh, information dissemination is like the scanners that we have at different public places like airports and some other kind of stations. So in, uh, in US they have, they installed such kind of uh, scanners that were creating, that were actually displaying the, the real images of the human body. So and it is quite possible due to the high tech <coughs> scanners. So. Uh, then they actually uh, you know there was a movement against such kind of scanners that it is again uh, violation of the privacy and it should be stopped and the images should be like uh, and the kind of uh, you know is the imaginary or the fake images it should be just standard kind of uh, images and it shouldn't be the real real images of the human body 
so in in actually uh, in 2013 they removed such kind of scanners that's all for this uh, chapter